House of the Dragon Episode 4 is about sex, secrets, and lies. Characters make dramatic, emotional choices that may have unwanted consequences. The episode starts at Storm's End, the castle of House Baratheon. We hear thunder rumbling and wind gusting in the background, because this place is famous for its storms. The winds roar up from the narrow sea and slam into the walls of Storm's End. According to legend, Storm's End was built by Duran Godsgrief. The gods kept destroying his castles, so he rebuilt them stronger until he finally built Storm's End, a castle strong enough and magic enough to withstand the fury of the gods. The Lord of Storm's End is Boromund Baratheon. We saw Boromund speak up for Rhaenys Targaryen at the tournament in Episode 1, because Boromund is Rhaenys' uncle. Boromund is one of the great lords of Westeros, ruling the Stormlands, just like the Starks rule the North and the Lannisters rule the Westerlands. Rhaenyra is here to find a husband. She's on tour, visiting castles to meet some single men. Noble families often have tours like this to find a marriage partner. The books describe one king meeting a thousand single girls in one day, and it's described as a cattle show, because the girls are all lined up like farm animals. So it's not exactly romantic, and Rhaenyra is not impressed by these men. This sexy single is from House Dondarrion, the family of Beric Dondarrion in Game of Thrones. Rhaenyra is not interested in his dry moat, but the Dondarrion mentions Rhaenyra's great-grandmother, Queen Alysanne, the wife of King Jaehaerys, who once visited the Dondarrion castle, Blackhaven. There, Alysanne was enthralled by a Dondarrion who played sad songs on his harp. Blackhaven is also where Kristen Cole is from. Kristen's dad worked for the Dondarrions as a steward, and Kristen fought with the Dondarrions against Dornish incursions. The next candidate is a boy from House Blackwood in the Riverlands. The Blackwoods are one of the only families in the South who worship the Old Gods like the Starks do. The Blackwood gets insulted by this guy from House Bracken, because the Blackwoods and the Brackens have an ancient blood feud. These families have hated and fought each other for thousands of years. The Blackwoods say that the Brackens poisoned their sacred weirwood tree. King Jaehaerys tried to make peace between these families, but it didn't last. At one point, the Blackwoods and Brackens fight for control of a pair of hills called the Teats, and they argue over whose boobs the hills are named after. Are they Barbara Bracken's Teats or Missy Blackwood's Teats? In the main series, the Brackens side with the Lannisters while the Blackwoods support the Starks, and Lord Titos Blackwood has an extremely cool raven feather cloak, so the Blackwoods, naturally, are fan favourites among book readers. When the Bracken insults the Blackwood kid, Rhaenyra says she likes the Bracken. Seems like Rhaenyra is attracted to bad boys and bullies, like her uncle Daemon. Rhaenyra still wears the necklace that Daemon gave her. The Blackwood kid has enough of the Bracken's insults, so they fight, and the Blackwood kills the Bracken. This is another example of random violence breaking out when it's not meant to. Like those knights killing each other at the tournament in episode 1. Like Rhaenys said, there are a lot of young dumb men in the realm who are eager to fight for glory after these long decades of peace. Some of these other eligible bachelors are from houses Tully, Frey, and House Mud. And the mud is weird, because House Mud went extinct about 4,000 years ago. The castle of the Mud Kings has been a ruin for so long that no one remembers its name. So this guy telling Rhaenyra he's a Mud is kind of like coming to a first date and saying you're an Egyptian pharaoh. That said, in the books, there are some characters who claim to be descendants of House Mud, including the mysterious Jenny of Oldstones, who Podrick sings a song about in Game of Thrones. Rhaenyra gets sick of the speed dating, and she heads back to King's Landing, even though she was meant to keep touring for two more months. Daemon Targaryen also returns to the city, after he was off at war on the Stepstones. Daemon swoops his dragon dangerously over Rhaenyra's ship, 
because Daemon is always desperate for attention and never misses the chance to cause some chaos. In this episode, Daemon's disruptive behaviour rocks the boat, both literally and metaphorically. When Daemon returns, the mood at court is tense, because last time Daemon was here, his brother King Viserys exiled him and removed him as heir to the throne. Then Daemon practically rebelled against Viserys, stealing a dragon egg. So now Viserys tries to show strength and authority by meeting Daemon in the throne room, wearing his crown and holding the royal sword Blackfire. Daemon presents the hammer of the crab feeder, who Daemon killed last episode. This is the hammer that the crab feeder used to nail people to the beach to die. Daemon says that he copied the crab feeder's brutal execution method to kill thousands of Triarchy men. So like when he killed and mutilated people with his gold cloaks, Daemon again uses violence to create fear. Daemon says to add the crab feeder's hammer to the Iron Throne, to join the other weapons of the Targaryen's defeated enemies. Barristan says a similar thing in Game of Thrones. Daemon wears a crown and calls himself King of the Narrow Sea, which is the ocean north of the Stepstones. It is provocative to call himself king, as though he's the equal of Viserys. But then Daemon kneels and gives up his crown. So Daemon makes his homecoming dramatic and theatrical, seeking glory and validation for his accomplishments. In the books, Daemon's return is even more dramatic. Daemon swoops down on his dragon during a tournament to give Viserys his crown. Viserys forgives Daemon's crimes and the brothers reunite. They have a boozy garden party and talk about their childhood. The books say that Viserys loves Daemon because he remembers the fun, adventurous boy Daemon used to be, and he tries to ignore the violent, selfish man he's become. Viserys mentions their mother, Alyssa, and how she was a rebel who broke rules. Alyssa was a tomboy, kinda like Arya Stark, Alyssa had a crooked, broken nose from playing with a wooden sword, and her eyes were two different colours. Alyssa's two favourite activities were having sex with her husband Balon and riding her dragon, Melis. Alyssa took her sons Viserys and Daemon on dragon rides when they were just babies. Then Alyssa died young from childbirth complications, and now Rhaenys Targaryen rides Alyssa's dragon, Melis. Rhaenyra and Alicent start to reconnect, because Alicent feels lonely. Everyone treats her as a queen, not as a friend. She feels trapped in this castle, making babies all day. Alicent has now given birth to a daughter, her second child after Aegon. Alicent envies Rhaenyra's freedom in getting to choose a husband. Alicent didn't get to choose her husband, her father Otto pushed her to be with Viserys. Rhaenyra had been angry at Alicent for suddenly marrying her dad and becoming a political rival, but now she's sympathetic and they hold hands again like they used to. This moment of friendship makes it more painful later when the relationship is again threatened. Rhaenyra speaks with Daemon in the Valyrian language, which is like their way of speaking secretly and intimately. Rhaenyra tells Daemon that she doesn't want to get married, because she doesn't want to be trapped and lonely like Alicent, and she doesn't want to die in childbirth like her mother Emma did, and like her grandmother Alyssa died of childbirth, and like her other grandmother Daella also died in childbirth. But Daemon says that you shouldn't live alone or in fear, or else you'll miss out on life. You've got to take risks, break rules, and do what you want. Daemon's life philosophy sounds inspiring, but Daemon also has a hidden motivation. Daemon hopes to have sex with Rhaenyra and to marry her. So he plays the creepy uncle, giving Rhaenyra wine, telling her that she's matured. Rhaenyra asks why Daemon returned, what does he want, and it seems that what Daemon wants is Rhaenyra. We see a meeting of the small council. Tyland Lannister is now master of ships to replace Corlys, and now Rhaenyra is on the council. She has a small council ball and everything. Looks like Viserys is finally including Rhaenyra so that she can learn politics, which is super important for the heir to the throne. The council is worried about Corlys Velaryon. 
Despite Daemon calling himself the King of the Narrow Sea, it sounds like Corlys now controls the region. And now Corlys plans to marry his daughter Lena to the son of the Sea Lord of Bravos. Bravos is a city in the east, it's where Arya Stark joined the Faceless Men in Game of Thrones. Westeros usually gets along okay with Bravos, but Bravos is powerful. They're very rich and have a strong navy, so Otto is worried that if Bravos allies with the Valerions, their combined strength could dominate the Narrow Sea, and potentially become a threat to the Targaryens. Corlys is still angry that Viserys rejected Lena's marriage proposal. Otto says that he learned about Corlys' plans from his brother Hobart in Old Town, which is weird. Why would Hobart in Old Town know about Corlys Velaryon's plans? Well, Old Town is the home of the Citadel of the Maesters, and the Maesters send the letters between all the lords of Westeros. So maybe the Hightowers are using the Maesters to spy on lords across the realm. There are hints in the books of a Maester conspiracy. That night, Daemon leaves a message for Rhaenyra. It shows her a secret passage out of her room in the Red Keep. The Red Keep was built by King Maegor the Cruel, and Maegor filled the keep with secret passages, hidden doors and steps. There are tunnels to escape the castle in case of attack. There are spaces in the walls so that child spies can listen to conversations. After the Red Keep was built, Maegor had all the construction workers killed, so that his secret passages would stay secret. In Game of Thrones, Varys knows about these passages and uses them to free Tyrion. In Hot D, Daemon knows these passages. Previously, we saw him spying on the small council from some hidden space. Now he uses a passage to sneak Rhaenyra out of the castle, to take her for a night on the town of freedom and fun. Disguised in different clothes and with a hat, Rhaenyra is freed from the restrictions of being a princess. She's thrilled to be mistaken for a boy. It's like when Arya pretends to be a boy and experiences life as a common person. We see a street performer doing what looks like fire magic. Or it might just be some cheap trick. In the books, Melisandre mentions using flammable powders instead of real magic. But in Book 2, Daenerys sees a fire magic performance, and Quaithe says that the magic is real. She says that magic is now more powerful because Daenerys hatched dragons. It seems that whenever there are dragons in the world, magic is stronger. And at the time of Hot D, there are lots of dragons, so this might be an especially magical time in Westeros. Maybe that's why Viserys has prophetic dreams. Rhaenyra and Daemon see a street theatre show, like the one Arya sees in Bravos. This reveals how the common people feel about the royal family. We see Daemon in his armour, and Rhaenyra in her dress, and baby Aegon with his dragon toy. We learn that many common people want baby Aegon to inherit the throne, not Rhaenyra, because Aegon is male, while Rhaenyra is a feeble female. Rhaenyra says that the common people don't matter, their desires are of no consequence. Rhaenyra used those same words, no consequence, when she told Viserys that her own desires don't matter. Rhaenyra feels like no one cares about her opinion, so why should she care about anyone else's? But we saw in Game of Thrones that the common people do matter. When they turn against the Lannisters, they start a deadly riot and support the Sparrows overthrowing Cersei. Good politicians know that to be a successful ruler, you've got to win over the common people. Rhaenyra steals food from a street vendor just for the thrill of breaking rules, and she bumps into Harwin Strong, the son of Lionel Strong, who we met last episode. Harwin has joined the Goldcloaks while his family is at court, and Daemon was once the commander of the Goldcloaks. So Harwin lets Rhaenyra continue on her secret nighttime adventure. Daemon takes Rhaenyra to a sex club to show her that sex is not just an obligation in marriage to produce babies. Sex can be for pleasure and passion. These opulent orgies fit with the theme of decadence. This is a time of prosperity, indulgence, and carefree pleasure, like ancient Rome before the fall. 
While Rhaenyra enjoys fun and freedom, Queen Alicent is stuck at home, looking cold and lonely. Alicent gives a sponge bath to her husband Viserys, whose body is falling apart from the infection that started in his hand. In the books, Alicent cared for the old king, Jaehaerys, like this when he was sick, helping to bathe and dress him. The jester Mushroom claims that Alicent also had sex with Jaehaerys. There are also rumours that Alicent had sex with Viserys before his wife Emma died, and Mushroom claims that Alicent lost her virginity to Daemon. So believe it or not, the books have even more secret scandalous sex rumours than this episode does. Later, Viserys and Alicent have sex, and Alicent gets no pleasure. For her, sex is a duty where her body is used to produce children. We see Alicent fidgeting with her fingers, a sign of anxiety and discomfort. Afterwards, she sees a mouse or rat on the bed, which might represent corruption or sickness, or that Viserys has been eating cheese in bed. So while Alicent is trapped in a bad sexual experience, Rhaenyra explores the pleasure of her sexuality. She and her uncle Daemon start hooking up, and Rhaenyra's into it, but then Daemon stops and just walks away. According to the show's creators, Daemon wanted to shock Rhaenyra, and he wanted to be in control of this situation. So he was thrown off when Rhaenyra was more passionate and into this than he was. Deep down, Daemon knew that using Rhaenyra like this was wrong. So suddenly he felt impotent, unable to continue. Like previously, when he stopped having sex with Mazaria. So Daemon leaves. Rhaenyra feels unsatisfied, so when she gets back to the keep, she playfully flirts with Sir Criston, kisses him, and takes off his Kingsguard armour. Criston is reluctant, because as a Kingsguard knight, he has sworn to never have sex, and he especially can't have sex with the princess, that's treason. In the books, a Kingsguard knight called Terence Toyne gets executed for the crime of having sex with a king's mistress. A knight called Lucamore Strong, a relative of Lionel and Harwin Strong, was found to have secretly had three wives and fathered sixteen children while on the Kingsguard. So King Jaehaerys had Lucamore's penis cut off and sent him to the Night's Watch. So Criston knows the danger here, but he wants Rhaenyra, and he may feel obligated to obey his princess. So Criston feels deeply conflicted as he puts down his white Kingsguard cloak. In the books, a Kingsguard knight called Aris has sex with Ariane Martell. Aris doesn't want to soil his white cloak, but Ariane says there's no harm in love. Knights should be judged for how they use their sword, not for how they use their cock. So Rhaenyra and Criston have sex, and it feels playful and joyous as the princess loses her virginity to the White Knight. The next morning, Rhaenyra is happy to see Criston. Maybe she wants to continue this dangerous relationship. Rhaenyra no longer wears Daemon's necklace. Criston is the one she wants now. But Criston looks worried and distant, terrified that he'll be found out and punished. The books are full of these forbidden romances, like Jon Snow and Ygritte, and many of these relationships end in tragedy. In the books, the jester Mushroom has a very different version of what happened here between Rhaenyra, Criston, and Daemon. Mushroom claims that Rhaenyra originally wanted Criston, so Daemon gave Rhaenyra sex lessons to teach Rhaenyra how to seduce Criston. But according to Mushroom, Criston rejected Rhaenyra and kept to his Kingsguard vows. A big theme of the book Fire and Blood is that the historians are often wrong and don't know the real story of what happened behind closed doors. Daemon wakes up extremely hungover. It looks like he tried to drink enough to forget that he macked on his niece. Daemon's ex-lover Mazaria gave him a place to crash. It sounds like Daemon and Mazaria haven't seen each other in years. Mazaria reveals that she's no longer a sex worker, she's now a spy master, known as the White Worm. Cause when Rhaenyra leaves the sex club, she's seen by a young boy. 
And that boy then goes to Otto Hightower and tells him that Rhaenyra hooked up with Daemon. Now the boy brings money back to Mazaria, payment for the information. So instead of selling sex, Mazaria now sells secrets. It's like how Littlefinger in Game of Thrones uses brothels both for selling sex and for spying. But why would Mazaria tell Otto about Daemon and Rhaenyra? That'll get Daemon in trouble. Maybe Mazaria wants to hurt Daemon as revenge for abandoning her and for using her in his Dragonstone plots. Otto says that Mazaria is a trusted source of information. It sounds like they've been working together for a while. So maybe it was Mazaria who told Otto about Daemon's Air for a Day speech in episode 1. Maybe Mazaria has been working against Daemon all along. Then again, Daemon did want to be seen with Rhaenyra at the sex club. He took off Rhaenyra's hat so that she'd be recognised. So maybe Daemon wanted Mazaria to tell Otto that he hooked up with Rhaenyra. Because if people think that Rhaenyra's been de-virginised by Daemon, it's more likely that he'll be allowed to marry Rhaenyra. But does Mazaria know that Daemon wants Otto to know? The whole Mazaria situation is mysterious. So Otto finds out that Daemon hooked up with Rhaenyra, and this is a big opportunity for him politically. Because if he can discredit Rhaenyra and Daemon, that makes it more likely that his grandson Aegon will become heir to the throne instead. But Otto also knows that this news will hurt Viserys, and the showrunners say that despite all his plotting, Otto does love Viserys and doesn't want to hurt him. Nonetheless, Otto tells Viserys that his daughter had sex with his brother, and Viserys gets angry. He accuses Otto of trying to undermine Rhaenyra to support Aegon, which is true. Viserys finally starts to realise that his trusted hand is corrupt, just like his actual hand is corrupt and infected. And Alicent overhears this conversation, so then Alicent confronts Rhaenyra about her having sex with Daemon. Alicent is angry, because a princess having sex out of wedlock is seen as a terrible, scandalous dishonour, not only to Rhaenyra but to the whole royal family. Rhaenyra losing her virginity makes her a less desirable wife, which could make it harder to make a good marriage alliance. And incest and adultery are considered sins by the faith of the Seven, and Alicent is a devout believer. Some people, like Daemon, don't care about these rules. He thinks Targaryens can do whatever they want. But Alicent lives by these rules. She is trapped in these rules. So maybe Alicent feels envious that Rhaenyra gets to do what she wants while Alicent is trapped in a lonely marriage with Viserys. Alicent may also just feel scared that if Rhaenyra is punished and sent away, Alicent could lose her only friend. When Rhaenyra is faced with this dangerous allegation, she lies. She swears on her mother's memory that Daemon didn't touch her, which he totally did. Making a false oath like this is pretty bad in Westeros, especially in front of a weirwood tree. Rhaenyra and Alicent don't believe in the Old Gods' religion, but symbolically there's a sense that the Old Gods see Rhaenyra's lie. How will Alicent react if she finds out about this lie? Alicent and Rhaenyra's relationship is probably the longest and most intimate relationship in both their lives. They grew up together, they love each other. So secrets between them can leave deep, painful wounds. Later, Alicent tells Viserys that she believes that Rhaenyra is innocent. She sticks up for her friend, which makes it all the more tragic that Rhaenyra lied. Viserys confronts Daemon, angry at him for having sex with Rhaenyra. Of course, Daemon didn't have sex with Rhaenyra, but Daemon lets Viserys believe that he did. Because if Rhaenyra is no longer a virgin, it'll be harder to marry her off. So Daemon says he'll marry Rhaenyra. And this is a political move by Daemon, because Rhaenyra is heir to the throne. As her husband, Daemon could potentially rule Westeros. So it looks like this was Daemon's plan all along, to use Rhaenyra to get the throne, and to piss off Viserys. Daemon resents Viserys for exiling him, for not making him hand, for not giving him the love and validation that he wants. 
Daemon succeeds in pissing off Viserys, but he fails to get Rhaenyra as wife. Viserys says no, partly because Daemon is already married to his estranged wife, Rhea. And while the Faith has accepted Targaryen incest, the Faith is not okay with polygamy. Viserys exiles Daemon again, tells him to go back to his wife in the Vale and to never come back. Then Viserys confronts Rhaenyra, and he tells her that her personal desires aren't as important as the strength of House Targaryen. Because of Aegon the Conqueror's dream, his prophecy that the Targaryens will save the world from the White Walkers, Aegon wrote a message on his Valyrian steel dagger that only appears when it's in fire, like the One Ring. And it says, From my blood come the prince that was promised, and his will be the Song of Ice and Fire. So what does that mean? The prince that was promised, or Azor Ahai, is a prophesied hero, the Chosen One who will lead the war against the White Walkers. In the Game of Thrones show, Melisandre thinks Stannis is the prince that was promised, then she thinks it's Jon Snow, then she thinks that both Jon and Daenerys have a role to play, so then Jon and Daenerys help in the battle when Arya kills the Night King, using Aegon's dagger. In the books, the prophecy stuff is more complicated. It's said that the hero will use a burning sword called Lightbringer. There are themes of sacrifice that might connect to Jon killing Daenerys. The Song of Ice and Fire is a line from Book 2, when Daenerys has a vision of her brother Rhaegar. Rhaegar says that his son is the prince that was promised, and his is the Song of Ice and Fire. Rhaegar does change his mind a lot about who the prince that was promised is, but there are lots of hints that Rhaegar's son, Jon Snow, is probably the chosen one. Jon is the son of an icy Stark and a fiery Targaryen, making him a song or son of ice and fire. Ned Stark promises to protect Jon, which makes Jon literally a prince that was promised. So it looks like in the books, Jon will probably play a bigger role in defeating the White Walkers. He won't just shout at a dragon while Arya saves the day. But prophecies are ambiguous and the book series isn't finished, so it's still a mystery how the books will end. The point of all this is that the Targaryen throne is a huge responsibility. It's not just about personal desires, it's about protecting the bloodline that will save the world. So Rhaenyra should not undermine their strength and stability by rooting her uncle. Viserys says that the old king Jaehaerys would have disinherited Rhaenyra for this, because Jaehaerys had similar trouble with his daughter Sarah when Sarah had secret scandalous sex. Jaehaerys was furious and said that Sarah was no longer his daughter, and Sarah ran off to a brothel in the east. Of course, it's very unfair that women aren't allowed sexual freedom, while men can generally root who they want without consequence. But Viserys says that the time for childish rebellion is over. He says Rhaenyra will marry Laenor Valerion, the son and heir of Lord Corlys, and the rider of the dragon Sea Smoke. Marriage to Laenor will renew the Targaryen alliance with the powerful Valerions to bring new strength and unity to the royal family. Rhaenyra reluctantly agrees to the marriage on the condition that Viserys removes Otto as Hand of the King. Rhaenyra knows that Otto is plotting against her, trying to make Aegon heir instead of her, so Viserys agrees to remove his corrupt hand. Viserys confronts Otto and talks about his father, Balon Targaryen, the husband and brother of Alyssa. Prince Balon the Brave was a warrior. He rode the great dragon Vega and wielded the Valyrian steel sword Dark Sister, now used by Daemon. Balon became Hand of the King to his father, King Jaehaerys, and in the books, Balon served as Hand for over a year. He was effective and popular with lords and common folk. But then Balon died of a burst belly, which might mean appendicitis. So Otto Hightower became the new Hand. Now Viserys seems to suspect that Otto murdered Balon with poison or something, so that Otto could become Hand. Viserys is now deeply suspicious of Otto, because Viserys has realised that Otto has been manipulating him for years. 
It was Otto's plan for Alicent to hook up with Viserys, exploiting Viserys's grief for his dead wife to serve Otto's ambition to get his daughter married to the king. Viserys can no longer trust Otto, so he removes him as hand. Though the Hightowers remain a powerful and ambitious family. Grand Maester Melos brings Rhaenyra some moon tea. This is the Westerosi version of a morning after pill, a plan B, or plan T. So if Rhaenyra got pregnant last night, this will end the pregnancy, to prevent any troublesome royal bastards being born. Melos says that Viserys sent Rhaenyra the tea, but maybe Melos's buddy Otto told him to do it. Otto doesn't want Rhaenyra birthing any sons who might claim the throne ahead of Aegon. Melos leaves and the episode ends, so we don't know for sure if Rhaenyra drinks the tea. Maybe Kristen Cole's bastard son is growing inside her. The last words in this episode are unwanted consequences. Because the characters make emotional decisions that might come back to bite them. Daemon hooks up with Rhaenyra, Rhaenyra hooks up with Kristen and lies to Alicent, Viserys rejects Daemon and Otto, Mazaria spies for Otto, and this Blackwood kills this Bracken. All these acts could lead to bigger conflicts later on. King Viserys is getting sicker and weaker each episode. And when he dies, there'll be multiple conflicting claimants to his throne. There's a shot of rats on a dragon skull, like scavengers feasting on the corpse of House Targaryen. The characters' choices now will shape the conflicts to come. If you want to know more about Balon the Brave, and Alyssa, and Sarah, and Jaehaerys, the full story is told in Fire and Blood, chapters 10 and 11. You can get Fire and Blood, or any other audiobook, for free right now at audible.com ASX. Sign up for a Premium Plus trial membership and you get an audiobook to keep, even if you cancel the trial. You can get any Game of Thrones book, or Lord of the Rings, or Dune. Membership also includes unlimited access to thousands of audiobooks and shows in the Audible Plus catalogue. Sign up at audible.com ASX, or text ASX to 500-500. Thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe, and check out the podcasts linked below. Thanks to the patrons, including Maggie Brockway, Tom Crow, Kustkamp Conrad, Juan Camilo Ruiz, Theodore Zen, Matthew Slippenchuk, and Noob Fu. Cheers.